we could bow our heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, <coughs> <coughs> praise you and thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, for your love and grace, for the blessings that you've given us. We thank you, Lord, that each and every day your love, your grace is renewed fresh in our lives. We pray, Lord, that you continue to guide our lives as we go forward. Help us to grow closer to you and to each other. And help us to know your will. We ask that you bless Pastor John and his message today. And we ask that you continue to guide our lives. In your son Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. I will be reading this morning from... I think lost my place. Oh boy. Well. Oh. John seventeen. Starting at verse 5. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me and they have kept thy word. And now they have known all the things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou hast given me, and they have received them, and have known, surely I am come out of thee, come from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine, and all are mine, are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. Amen. Announcements. Pastor's Prayer and Praise Night will be meeting this Thursday, September 21st, at 7 p.m. All are welcome to attend, as well as those of you who may be in need of prayer, to gather together with the family and have your prayers heard. Grace Christian Fellowship Youth Ministry will be meeting September 23rd from 5 to 7 p.m. That's this Saturday. We ask to encourage all our youths to attend for this time, to bond and fellowship with one another with Bible challenges, activities, fun, and prizes. For more information, please see our sister Jackie or our brother Rodney. Men's Ministry. We will be meeting this Friday, September 22nd, at my house. If you need directions, see me after service. We will be eating, we're gonna have a cookout, and then the men's ministry. We're gonna be eating at 6.30, so if you'd like to get there around six for fellowship, more than welcome. And all men are welcome to attend. We'll be meeting at my house for an outside barbecue. Those who wish to attend, please see Pick for directions. And if it does rain, the alternate is gonna be here and we will have the cookout here. So if it rains hard, then it, it will meet here. But we're praying for no rain, so it'll be at my house. Women's ministry will be meeting this Tuesday, September 19th at 6.30. All ladies are welcome to attend. And also, please keep in remembrance 
Our, our sister, Debbie Romano, who had surgery this week on her foot, and just pray for her continued healing. And with that said, let's stand and praise the Lord.
to a land where joy will never end. I fly away.
but life is old. But God may gently send me on to thy kingdom, kingdom shore, to thy shore, yeah, 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 just a closer walk with me. Just a closer walk with me. Granted, Jesus, tis my seated. Children may now be dismissed for Sunday school classes. And I have it from a reliable source that our sister Jackie is having a birthday tomorrow. And also after service, in the Fellowship Hall, we will be having coffee and, and the and is a surprise. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our pastor, Pastor John Ritchie. Good morning, folks. Praise God. It's good to be with God's people. There's no better place to be on Sunday morning than church, as they say in certain circles, with God's people. Do we have any first-time visitors today? First-time visitor over here? Let's, yeah, let's give them one back there. Well, we're going to give, we're going to give you a gift anyway. How's that? Got a gift here of a Bible promise book, and this gentleman over here, John, Bible promise book. Uh, contains 199 promises of God for every need. This is our way of saying we're so glad you're here. Welcome, and we pray that it all be a blessing to you. Let's give him a hand clap. Amen. Amen. Okay, this morning, if we could take our Bible, and I'd like you to turn with me to uh, Romans chapter 8. And we're going to begin there in a moment. I do have a special prayer request that we're going to pray for before we go to our study of the Word this morning. And uh, if we could bow our heads, we'd go before the Lord. Father, we are so grateful and so thankful this morning to be able to once again gather together with the people of God around the Word of God and to the name of our risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. This morning, I prayed that through the Word, you would challenge our hearts, that we would continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Father, I ask that I could speak your Word with wisdom, grace, humility, conviction, and passion, and with the authority that your Word deserves to take the knowledge that you have given me on this subject, make it clear and simple and accurate and understandable. Pray if there be anyone here today that's unsaved, that you'll open their heart. Convict them of their sin, that they might believe in Christ as their Savior. And we pray a special prayer this morning, Lord, for the family of Demi Rome. Lord, we pray that you would comfort them now at her passing. Pray that you would reveal your love and your grace to them, Lord, in a special way. And Father, I pray that you would relieve the grief in the days ahead and replace it with precious fond memories and 
the joy and celebration of her life. And I pray today, Father, for those family members that are grieving, that are unsaved, that don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, because, Father, without Christ, death has the victory. So I pray, Father, that those that are unsaved, those dear loved ones, that you would convict them of their need of Jesus Christ. And use this time, Lord, to touch their hearts and draw them to Christ, that they might turn to him and believe on him and find in him peace and comfort, encouragement, forgiveness of sins, eternal life, and strength for the journey. So we put them in your hands right now and we ask your blessing on the message this morning and it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen and amen. So let's take our Bibles and let's turn to Romans chapter 8 and we're going to look at a very familiar verse of the Bible. A very familiar verse, but I believe a verse that probably is... Not, not misunderstood, it's understood, but, but misapplied by many Christians. And the subject of our study starting this week and probably over the next couple Sundays is going to be divine providence at work in the Apostle Paul's ministry. Div noting and seeing divine providence at work in the Apostle Paul's ministry. But before we get into that aspect of it, and we'll be looking at Acts chapter 15 and kind of picking up where we left off last week, I want to look at Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, and I want to cover some ground that is very important and, and I think needs to be understood by Christians. It needs to be more than a superficial approach to the Word of God. And I hope that I'll be able to do this this morning for you and make you understand this verse in its proper context of the whole Scripture and of experience in life. Look at verse 28. It says, And we know that all things, that means all things, right? The good, the bad, the ugly, the sorrows, the pains, the joys, the triumphs, the sins, the failures, the mistakes, the victories, successes, all things work together for good, to them that love God. And I want you to note that in your Bible, please. To them that love God. Underline it, highlight it, note it. To them who are the called according to his purpose. And we know from Romans 8, 29 that the purpose of God is to make us into the image of Christ. So the good that is being spoken about is not just that our problems will be fixed, our needs will be met, our unfulfilled desires will be fulfilled. But the good being spoken of is that God is using all things to make us like who? Christ. That's his purpose. And I want you to understand something today. And this is going to kind of rock the world of some of you folks, okay? All things are not working for good for all God's children. You say, what? Well... We're going to explain that to you. Because the Bible says it works for good to them that love God. Now, there's many people who are saved who they believed in the Lord and they surely have faith and they've trusted Him. And they have a measure of love for God. But they don't have the love that Jesus described that causes all things to work together for good. And I'm going to demonstrate that to you this morning. And that's the challenge is to understand that God is at work for all things for the good in the life of the growing positive believer. I want you to go with me and we're going to look at John chapter 14. And let's understand this morning what does it really mean biblically to love God. We're not talking about some human emotion that people experience when they talk about Jesus. We're not talking about sentimentality towards church and the things of God. We're talking about how does the Bible define 
what loving God is really all about. And once we understand that, then we will understand how there are certain brothers and sisters that we look at their lives and we know all they've got is one trouble after another, one bad decision after another, one backsliding after another, a vicious cycle that goes on for decades. It seems like they're always up against it. Nothing ever seems to work out for them. Doors are always closed. Problems mount. They give in to sublimation and fear and guilt and drugs and alcohol and they stumble through life and it makes you say what well, didn't God say everything work out for good yes but he added to them that what love God well I know brother so and so and sister so and so believes in Jesus yes but to love God is far more than just believing in Jesus as your Savior we have got to understand this this morning and be correct about it in our thinking. We need to be biblical in our thinking. Jesus defines what love for God is. Look at verse number 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them. What does it mean to keep his commandments? Does it mean to obey them all perfectly? No. To keep means to cherish, to guard, to hold in high esteem to strive to do God's will, knowing that we're human and we still what? Err. But it is that motivation and desire to cherish God's commands and His Word and the things of God and to eagerly desire and be motivated to what? Do what God says, even though we know we're not perfect and we fall short. But we're talking about motivation here. We're talking about positive volition. Volition means your will. Having a positive will towards the things of God. Unfortunately, there are people that sit in church pew Sunday after Sunday who, who don't have a positive volition towards the things of God. They go out of, you know, want some social life, or I should go to church on Sunday, it's the thing to do, out of guilt, out of legalistic fear, many different motivations. But they're not there eagerly seeking to know God's truth and obey it because they truly love the Lord. There's another motivation. And then, of course, there are distracted Christians all over the place, backslidden out in the world, distracted by a hundred different things. And things are not working out in their life for good. Their life seems to be a constant struggle and failure. Now, we all go through struggles and failures, but we know when we're positive that eventually there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Weep and endure it for the night, but joy cometh in the morning. There is a what? a place where things do start to work for good and everything starts to fall in place. And yet we know there's brothers and sisters who must confess if they're honest, this is not my experience as a Christian. Because with that promise of all things working together for good is the condition, them that what? Love God. Now keep reading here. Let's keep getting at this. If you can handle it. Don't choke on it this morning. If it's convicting, then you need to what? Accept it and make some corrections. And he says, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. Hmm. See? That's how you love God, by keeping his commandments. Keep reading. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and I will manifest myself to him. Now, of course, God loves all his children, but what he's saying is, this is human language of human accommodation by Jesus to emphasize that those that are fulfilling God's plan are especially pleasing to who? The Father. Because they are accomplishing his purpose. They are being conformed to the image of Christ. Oh, they're not perfect. There's still work to be done. But changes are taking place. Growth is happening, and it's happening because they have the proper motivation and attitude towards the commands and the Word of God. Do you understand what we're talking about here today? Now look at verse number 23. Uh, let me read verse 22. Let's read it. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, there were a couple of Judases, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest or reveal thyself unto us and not unto the world. And look at verse 23. 
Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. That word keep, again, to tereo in Greek, to cherish, to guard, to protect. It's speaking of the motivation with the great desire to what? Do what God's word commands. But also, if you don't love this book, if it's not precious to you, if you don't, if you're not eager to want to come to church and hear the pastor preach the doctrines of the book because you want to learn more of God, and not only do you want to learn it, you want to obey it in your life so that you can see God at work and receive his highest and best blessings that he promises and see the fulfillment of everything in your life working towards his purpose, if you don't have that motivation, you're not loving God, folks. And unfortunately, a lot of Christians, it's not a, the priority in their life is them. Me, myself, my own, and God has a place over here. That's not loving God. You will know if you love God by your attitude towards this book. Do you hear me? Your attitude towards this book. Do you cherish these words? Let's keep finishing reading this verse. He says, he will keep my words. My father will love him and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Remember we studied the soul, study the, <laughs> remember we studied the soul structure? SSS, that's tough to say those. Studied soul structure, right? Remember that? And we said, what does it mean for God to come and make his abode or his home in us? It means to build that what? Soul structure. Okay? And don't tell me you've got a soul structure if you ain't obeying what God tells you to do. If you're constantly bumbling and stumbling and backsliding, there's a motivation problem there that's wrong. There's no soul structure. You've got some information, but you don't got a soul structure. And you can't love God without a soul structure. You can only love God as you store the knowledge of who he is here. If you don't know who he is and how he operates, how are you going to love him? You can believe in him. You can acknowledge Christ as your Savior and be saved. But you've got to grow in this love. And only when you start to grow in this love, which will be demonstrated by your attitude towards this book, only then are all things going to begin to work together for good. Now, I hope you get this this morning. I'll demonstrate it to you a little further. Those that love God, all things is working together for good. And don't forget that. He's talking about a positive, growing believer. He's not talking about a negative believer who gets hardened in negative volition. Those who refuse to learn, those who refuse to be instructed, those who become unstable in their ways, up and down, tossed about by every wind of doctrine. Those who don't respond to God's divine discipline and chastisement when he corrects them. Negative believers do not experience Romans 8, 28. There's some examples in the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse number 15. We read, If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Here we have the example at the Bema seat that there are believers whose works, which basically represents the life they lived after becoming Christians, will be judged and it will be burnt up and there will be no reward but thank God by God's grace they are saved because salvation is a what a gift but now note something can you honestly say everything worked for good in the life of a believer who has no reward and all their works are burnt up because they were wood hay and stubble worthless before God no they did not because if you're conformed to the image of Christ and you're growing and you're changing, what's happening? You're going to start bearing some what? Fruit. You see? Let's look at another verse. 2 Timothy. 
2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 26. It tells us about some Christians, and I would say there's a lot of Christians today caught in Satan's snare. And that they may recover themselves out of the snare or the trap of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. And in this passage, in context, Paul is talking about Christendom, the great house that has some vessels of honor and some vessels of dishonor. And he says there are Christians who are in Satan's snare. The devil doesn't have to set a trap for the unbelieving world. He already got them. The traps are set for Christians. And there are plenty of Christians today who have negative volition to God's word, but they're in church. And they think it's all about feelings and emotion and talking in tongues and prophecy and a lot of hoop de doo and hoopla. And all that is is a distraction from sound doctrinal teaching. There's no soul truck structure. There's only emotion. And they relate to God based upon their emotion. And things are not working for good because they're in Satan's what? Snare. They're in the devil's trap. Things are not working for good. Luke chapter 8. Look at verse number 13. Jesus in the parable of the sower and the seed. Look what he said. They on the rock are they which when they hear receive the word with joy and these have no root. In other words, they never got rooted in what? Grounded in God's word. They never fell in love with Jesus. How do I know if I love Jesus? Do you love the book? Do you love his word? If any man keeps my commands, he loves me. If you keep my words, then you love me. How could it be any clearer? All things work together for good for them that love him. Who is these people that love him? Them that keep his commands and cherish his word. Every other Christian, things are not working for good. Now you've got an answer to why you say, why is it that brother so-and-so has been a Christian so long, but their life is always a wreck? Why is it that sister so-and-so has been a Christian for so long, but their life is a wreck? Because truly at the heart of it, their own arrogance and pride in their soul has caused them to reject God's word. They may have a lot of information about what the Bible says, but they apply none of it. They're not loving God. This is some of the hard sayings of the Bible, right? But this is reality. And then it says, and these have no root which for a while believe, and in the time of temptation they fall away. They believed, but they what? End up getting tested and tempted, and the devil pulls them away from God's plan. Does everything work out for good for these kind of believers? No. They end up apostatizing. Saved as by what? Fire. Luke chapter 8, verse number 14. Luke chapter 8, verse number 14 we're going to look at. Another group of people is described by Jesus. And that which fell among the thorns are they which when they have heard go forth and are choked with the cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. Now this is, again, another example of believers that bring forth no what? Fruit to perfection. Perfection means maturity, completion. God's purpose of conforming them to Christ was never what? Fulfilled. There is no fruit to perfection. Why? They were distracted by the cares the riches and the pleasures of what? This life. Is everything working out for good for this group of believers? No. I know this is, this might be like all your life you've quoted eight, Romans 8, 28. And some of you, if you're honest, you say, yeah, but that's not what's happening to me. It, it just seems like one mess after another that I'm involved in. Well, because there's a condition. Those who love God, and how do you define loving God? It's not just getting emotional and going, Oh, Lord, I love you. Hallelujah, Jesus. No. That's emotion. You love God here in your heart by storing the knowledge of who he is and cherishing his word and his commands and then applying them to your life. This is serious stuff, folks. 
Let's understand what it means to love God, to keep his commandments and to cherish his what? Word. Then everything starts falling in place. Then even when you stumble and fall, it works out for good. And we can look at the Apostle Paul's life, which we're going to, hopefully this morning we'll get started, we'll see. He wasn't a perfect man, but his motivation was towards God, and God's divine providence followed him and kept working things out in his life. And the experience of positive believers is this. It's not always easy, and we're not perfect. We stumble, but God takes it and turns it into a good and uses it to make us more like Christ, and we advance. We're not going backwards. We're going forward. Sometimes three steps forward, two back, but we're gaining one. You understand here? Now, let's, let's keep going here. I just want to give you this because this is important. Hey. People distracted by the details and cares of life. You know, got to make a living, got to pay the bills, got to put the kids through school, got to do this, got to do that in the world, right? Priorities all what? Messed up. Go with me over to this one, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5. See, I don't just tell you these things and say, just believe it because pastor said it. I'm showing you what the Bible says, especially on this subject, because most people think, just because I'm a Christian, everything's got to work out for good. <laughs> no. No, no. You must add to that if I love God. And loving God means keeping his commandments and cherishing his what? Word. Salvation is free. Growth costs. You see? The life of blessing and fruitfulness requires effort and energy and motivation and discipline and right choices and right decisions. Thank God salvation is free because nobody get in, right? Nobody get in, right? Thank God. But is that all you want is just to get in heaven when it's over? Do you want life on earth to be 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 years of just one mess after another? One constant struggle, get beat up by life, and then when it's over you die and that's like the aspirin that ends it all? That's the pill that ends all the pain. That way you want to live on earth when God promises so much what more? Let's look at this. I want to give you another verse. Let's see if, if uh, 1 Corinthians 5, remember this fella? Here's the guy, you read 1 Corinthians 5, verses 1 to 5 on your own. We're just going to look at verse 5. There was a fella in Corinth. Paul said he was saved. He called him a brother. Said he was a saint, justified. And he was doing something, Paul said, even the pagans don't go this far. And you should have judged this. He was sleeping with his stepmother. Now, we don't know. Maybe his father died. Maybe his father uh, took off. But he was sleeping with his stepmother. Shocks us, right? Hey, David committed adultery and plotted the murder of a man. Noah got drunk. Samson used to drink and run around with loose women. We could go on. Abraham gave his wife away to a king to protect his own hide. Yet these are saved people. They made some big what? Blunders and failures. Are we promoting it? No. We're just recognizing that's the reality of human life on earth. So this guy saved is doing something terrible. Right? And what is Paul? But now here's the thing. Do you get away with sin just because you're saved? No. What did Paul say? to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Paul says, look, I'm giving him over to Satan, and if he doesn't repent of what he's doing, he's going to die early. The flesh will be destroyed. I'll let the devil get at him, and he'll go home. The Bible calls it the sin unto death. Uh, 1 John 5, 16, if you could put that up. I want to show you this is in the Bible. There's such a thing in the Bible called the sin unto death. If any man see his brother, again, a brother, a believer, sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death, I do not say that he shall pray for it. And I think what John means in that passage, first thing it establishes that a believer could, could commit a pattern. I don't think it means one sin. I think it means a pattern of behavior where it could lead to physical death. They will die physically and they will go to heaven before their time on earth was what? Up. 
God had plans for them to have a longer life and more blessing. They chose to live in sin and love their sin, and God takes them out before their time. The sin unto death, the pattern of behavior that leads to physical death. And interestingly enough, John says, uh, once a believer goes too far, no matter how you pray for them, they're going to die. See, some of you folks are like, what? Don't worry, God's not going to kill you because you stumbled and fell today or yesterday. He's talking about living in a pattern of what? Wicked behavior. Unrepentant. Not responding to the chastisement and correction of God. Right? Being rebellious. There's a certain point where God, God's going to say, don't pray for brother so-and-so anymore because he's been living this way for 20 years and he just don't want to get it. So we're just going to let it take its course and he's going to be out of here in a, in a little while. That's Bible, folks. That's Bible. Now, I just want to ask you a question. Is everything working out together for good for that fella or that gal? No. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 30. Did everything work together for good for these folks that we're going to read about? 1 Corinthians 11, verse number 30. You can turn there if you like. Paul was speaking to the Corinthian church, and, and the Corinthian church had all kinds of problems. Paul said, you're saints, you have every gift, you have all knowledge, you have all blessing, and yet there was divisions, there were factions fighting against each other in the church. There was men going down to the temple and fornicating with the temple prostitutes. All right? They were suing one another and caught and having legal battles and at each other's throat. They weren't sharing the, their food and the necessities of life with the people who were less fortunate and poorer in the congregation. They were getting drunk at the Lord's Supper. Can you imagine that? Drunk at the Lord's Supper. Paul never said you needed to be saved again. He said they needed to what? Judge themselves so God would not what? judge them or chastise them, okay? And then he says of all these people that are, and he called the Corinthians, he said, I can't write unto you as what? Spiritual, but as unto what? Carnal, babes in Christ. There are Christians, unfortunately, that remain babies in Christ. Now, it's okay to be a baby when you're six months year old, a year old, a couple years old, toddler stage, but have you been a Christian 20, 30, 40 years, 10 years? You shouldn't be a baby anymore. You should start to become spiritual. And if that's not happening, it's because you're not loving God and you're not going to see all things working together for good. Now look up here. It says about these carnal Corinthians who are saved people who will be in heaven. Their sins are forgiven, but their life on earth is not pleasing to God. For this cause many are weak. They had some type of weakness in their body. And sickly, some of them actually had physical sickness. Among you, and many what? Sleep. And the word sleep, when it's used in the New Testament of a Christian, it is a metaphor for physical what? Death. Paul was basically saying, look, because of how badly you Corinthians are behaving, and because God has chastised you and you won't repent and turn around and get right with him, you're suffering sickness and weakness, and guess what? Some of you have actually died and checked out early. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. I'm going to tell you something. I've, I've known, and I won't say names, because how do I know 100%, but I certainly have known believers and brothers in the Lord that over the 38 years I've been a Christian, 39 October, that they, they just they died young. And their life was one continual problem after another. It was because they were always reaping what they sowed. It wasn't the devil was after them. They were making horrible decisions and reaping what they sowed. And they checked out early because they never got it right. Some of it was heartbreaking to see. Now, who am I to judge everything? I, not, not everybody that dies young has died the sin of the death, so 
God has different purposes. It's not up for us to judge. But there are some believers who check out early. Now, I just want to ask you a question. If you don't understand what I'm saying this morning about how things work together only for those who love God, cherish his word, keep his commandment, was everything working out for good for these folks in this life? Sick, weak, and some of you are dead. No, they weren't being conformed to the image of Christ. Their life was one bad decision after another, more and more carnality. It's all about who? Me, self. The underlying root of that, now listen, I'm going to get hard on you. I'm going to get real hard. Okay? You know why this happens in people's life? Arrogance! Did you hear me? Oh, I'll say it again. Arrogance! You see, you can say, oh, I don't wear fancy clothes and I don't have a big fancy car. I'm humble. No, you're not. Arrogance is when you refuse to bow to the Word of God and do what God's Word said. You, could, you can appear to be so humble on the outside, but if you don't bow to the Word of God and do what God says, guess what? That's arrogance. But you know what the good news is? Our God loves arrogant people. In what sense? He sent Christ to die for them. And if you believe in him, he forgives you. And you get saved and you still listen. Now let's, let's, let's clear this up. We've all got some arrogance in us, right? But it's the choice of, am I going to live according to my arrogance? Or am I going to live according to what God says? Because to live according to what God says, I've got to humble myself and get rid of my arrogance and do what he says. Do you see? Okay. And the great news is because of God's grace, even those Christians who mess it all up down here, they land in heaven. Because salvation is a free what? Gift. Okay? Now I want you to continue with me this morning, and I'd like you to turn me to Acts chapter 15. Okay? And... Uh, we're moving along nicely here. I hope you came to study the Word of God. We don't play church when we get together. We actually try to dig into the Bible because, you see, I try to keep His words. I will confess to you, I love Jesus. You say, well, isn't that a little arrogant? No, uh, it's truth. I'm being very objective. I've spent my life trying to learn what this book says and help others understand it. I cherish it more than my very breath. Job said, I cherish your words above my daily food. I told you, I said it long ago, if my house was burning down, after I got my dogs out and my family members, if they were there, the next thing I'd grab is this. And I was in a situation where I was in a fire drill one time. And I, I, all right? I was in a fire drill at a place I worked. I used to work third shift. And they told us if the fire drill ever comes on uh, and you're not notified ahead of time, that's the real thing. How do you have a fire drill when you tell people you're going to have it? But that's what they used to do. We're going to have a fire drill. And everybody knew. And ring, all right, let's go. No, no, no immediacy, right? No urgency. Because you know it's not real. It's just, a, it's just a what? It's an exercise, right? Well, one night, and we never got warning. So this is the real thing. Everybody's panicking. They're running all over. Well, I grabbed all the kids, and I dragged them out of the building. And then I said, oh, you know, I took my Bible to work tonight to read. And they told us, never go back in the building. Guess who went back in? You know why? This old book was in there. And, and if you look at it, you know it's torn and it's tattered. That's a, that's a person that loves God, that cares about the things of God. It's not a brag. If you didn't believe your pastor loved God, what are you doing here? Go find a pastor who does love God. And I show my love by studying this book and by what? Feeding it constantly and consistently. And you look at it, it's all torn and tattered and written all over, notes all over. Why? It's more important than my daily food. You may not believe that when you look at me, but God's good. <laughs> God has made sure I get my three squares and sometimes more. That's one of the blessings of loving his word. He always provides plenty. Amen. 
Now, you with me in Acts 15? What's your attitude towards the book? And don't just quote it. Do you live it? Do you obey it? If you keep my commands, then you love me. Right? And listen, you don't get saved by loving God. You get saved by believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God who died and rose again. But you grow and get blessed and have everything work out together for good by loving him. You understand? Now you get over to Acts chapter 15. Now before we begin in this passage this morning, we're going to start just to break some ground here in the Apostle Paul's life. And, and, and it's wonderful study because we see, we're going to see as we get through Acts 15 and Acts chapter 16, and we're going to go verse by verse because that's, the, that's the called expository preaching and expository teaching. You take it verse by verse. The Bible says you ought to learn line upon what? Line here a little and what? There a little, right? That's how you learn the Bible. And we're going to look at Paul's life and we're going to see divine providence, the hand of God at work in his life. We're going to look at divine providence, okay, at work in his life. Uh, let me give you a definition again. We gave it to you a few weeks ago, but let's look at a definition of divine providence again. We'll look at the definition again. And what's divine providence? It's God's intervention into human history in his wisdom and perfect timing to accomplish his will and his what? Purposes. Let's repeat that. Divine providence is God's intervention into human history in his wisdom and perfect timing to accomplish his will and purposes. God works in human history according to his divine providence. He orders the events of history towards his ultimate purposes. He also works in our lives through divine providence. The lives of believers to accomplish his purpose in the life of Positive believers, God's at work in his divine providence to turn everything out for what? Good. If you love God's word and you're seeking God and you're motivated to do what God says, guess what? Things are going to work out for good. If it's all about you and, you're, ha and you're, you know, you're, you're arrogant in your soul and you can quote the Bible but you ain't, you ain't up to trying to obey it or do it, not going to work out for you. Not so much. Not going to happen. Okay? You're a negative believer, and you've got to get that corrected. What's God got for the positive believer? Everything working for good. What's he got for the negative believer? Correction, chastisement. Till you learn, okay? So we pick up in the account of Acts 15. We're at the conclusion of the first church council at Jerusalem. Remember that, where they got together to discuss how, uh, how were people saved and they came to the conclusion that people are saved by grace through faith alone in Christ alone. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And so we pick up in verse 30 in our account. Let's look at it. So when they were dismissed, they came to Antioch. And when they had gathered the multitude together... They delivered the epistle. Now, this was the letters that told the different churches what was the final conclusion and decision that was made by the church council concerning this issue of how are you saved, right? Which they had concluded by faith alone in Christ alone. I keep reading. Which, when they had read, they rejoiced for the consolation. The, the church at Antioch was happy at the decision made by the council. It, it, it was consoling. That means it comforted them. And verse 32, And Judas and Silas, being prophets also themselves, exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. So the church at Jerusalem sends Paul and Barnabas, uh, Judas and Silas, and other unnamed men down to Antioch to deliver this letter, this epistle, that's got the results of the decision of the Jerusalem council and it encourages these believers at Antioch. So far, so good. Let's read verse 33. And it says, And after they had tarried there a space, after they had waited a while, 
stayed a while, they were let go in peace from the brethren unto the apostles. So this contingent that went down to Antioch, once they accomplished their job and they hung around a little bit, and they delivered the epistle and the decisions, then they headed what? Back to Jerusalem. So you kind of get in the picture here? Okay. Verse number 34 and 35. Notwithstanding, it pleased Silas to abide there still. Now note that. Silas, everybody else is heading back. Silas says, oh, I don't know. I think I'll hang around a little what? Longer. Right? Is that just an accident? Is that just coincidence? We're going to see when we're looking at the life of the Apostle Paul, everybody heading back but Silas deciding to stay and hang around a little longer is actually divine providence at work. Okay? Silas stays. Look at verse 35. Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. Well, not only does Silas decide, you know what, I think I'll hang around a little longer. Uh, Paul and Barnabas, you know, they hang around. And, and they're going to use it as an opportunity to continue teaching and encouraging the believers and building them up, right? This is the first instance where we can note God's providence at work very clearly. Silas was pleased to stay at Antioch. And there's going to be something that happens, which is also a work of divine providence. Barnabas and Paul, two good friends, two beloved brethren, two men who had suffered together in spreading the gospel on the first missionary journey, Barnabas who had helped Paul get to, uh, people get familiar with Paul and accepted into the church, who was a man of gracious and kind heart, and Paul, an intense man who was sold out to make sure that the gospel got proclaimed as far and wide as possible, they're going to come into a great contention. They're going to get into a heated argument and debate. Two godly men, okay? And that's going to cause a division and a separation. And this, too, is divine providence at work. And we'll see as we continue and develop this understanding and the study of the word. Now, if you look here, we know that in verse 35 that Silas and Paul and Barnabas stay. And we're going to see as we go further that there's going to be this division between Barnabas and Paul, and it's going to be about a dispute they have over, a, a, not doctrine, they agreed on doctrine, about a person, a young man named John Mark. And it's going to cause a rift. And this too is God's hand. Okay? And uh, the thing is, Barnabas and Paul are going to separate. Now Paul needs someone to accompany him to be his right-hand man on this journey that he's about to partake on because he's, he says in verse 36, and some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. Now, Paul had a pastor's heart. He had established many churches, but they were young churches. There were a lot of young believers. He knew the devil would attack them. He knew there was the temptations of the world. His goal was, i got to get back to the churches that I established and see how they're doing and encourage them and build them up some more and strengthen them. He had a past his heart, right? This wasn't to really go out and win more souls, although they would. It was actually to help the ones who were already saved to be built up and grow in Christ, okay? And Barnabas is Paul's companion. He's the one who accompanies him on this journey. He's supposed to anyway, but what's going to happen is there's going to be a rift. And Paul is going to need another very loyal, committed, dependable, mature, godly, reliable man to stand by his side and go with him. Now, in the divine providence of God, God is never at a what? Loss. 
Why did, guess who's going to go with him? Silas. You think it was an accident that when the whole contingent said, well, we're going back to Jerusalem, that Silas said, you know what? I think I'll hang around a while. Most people would chalk that up to what? Coincidence. But we understand, if we understand divine providence, there are no coincidences. The little bird of a sparrow cannot fall from the heaven to the ground unless your father what? Wills it. Who put it in Silas's heart to stay at Antioch? God did. Why? Because God, in his foreknowledge and omniscience, foresaw the rift that was coming because of the dispute that would take place over John Mark between Barnabas and Paul. And he knew that Paul had a mission. And at this point, Barnabas, as good a man as he is, is going to put people before the truth and the work of God. And his sentimentality and emotional attachment to his nephew, John Mark, is going to cause him to go in a different direction and have a dispute that was not necessary. And we'll look at this. We're not going to be able to develop this all this morning, but we will next week, and it'll be very interesting. There's a lot here. But behind it all, we're going to see God's hand. You know, Barnabas is a, he's a, he's the type of guy, he's just, he's a people person. He's an encourager. He loves to build people up. You need those kind of folks, right? And Paul, Paul loves people and he's gracious, but Paul is about the mission, the purpose, the goal, the battle. You see? And nothing is going to deter Paul from that. And even though he loves people, no one person is more important than what? The mission. And he's intense about it. Barnabas is different. He wants to take the time to help this young man get fixed. Paul knows, I don't have time to waste trying to fix him. Right now, he ain't ready. He shouldn't come. We're going to see this. It's an interesting, interesting scenario that's developing here. And, and I believe both men were right. Barnabas, is his gift, his name means be encourager, right? Right in this sense. They were following what their heart was. Paul's heart is, nothing will deter me from, even though the Holy Ghost tells me that I'll suffer everywhere I go, I fear none of these things until I preach the gospel of the grace of God and fulfill my ministry as far and wide as I can, and nothing will deter me, right? He's intense about it. And you failed me on the last missionary journey. You took off because you were young and foolish and you weren't ready and you're not dependable and loyal and committed and reliable. I can't use you now. Maybe someday, but not now. Barnabas says, oh no, but I see the potential in this kid. Listen, he, he knows he was wrong. He's going to get it right. And back and forth they go. Okay? Let's read. Let's just read it in these last few minutes. In verse 37... As, as far as verse 36 is concerned, everything's okay, right, up to this point? Paul said, let's go visit the churches and make sure they're all doing what? Good. Barnabas is like, yeah, let's do that. He's an encourager, right? Look at verse 37. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was what? Mark, John Mark. Now, this is Barnabas's cousin. He says, well, why don't we take him with us? Verse 38, and Paul thought not good to take him with them who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. Barnabas is determined. Notice that word determined. That means he was... One thing we know about both of these guys, when they make up their mind about something, <laughs> you're not changing it. <laughs> right? Which can be a very good thing in a lot of ways. And other times it can be deterrent, right? But when these guys make up their mind and they got a conviction, you ain't changing it. Paul or Barnabas, right? Barnabas is determined he should come. Paul says, no, he shouldn't. <laughs> and Paul had a good reason. He already proved himself unworthy by being what? Disloyal, unfaithful, and leaving us when we needed him. And I'm not taking that chance again. 
And I believe Paul was right. You see, because Paul, his goal is the mission. And it must be accomplished. Barnabas, he's about encourage this person. You see? But I do believe that in this case, I'm, I'm, and it seems very clear that the Bible and the church sides with Paul, but we'll get into it probably not this week, more next week. In this particular case, Paul should have uh, won out. Barnabas should have backed down and went. But even in the divine providence of God, Barnabas takes John Mark and he goes to Cyprus. Paul takes Silas, who stayed because that's, God knew this was coming, and he goes their way to come for the churches. And even though I believe Barnabas made a mistake because he's a positive, growing believer that loves God's word, and he has a disagreement with Paul, he should have been with Paul, but he, 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 he took the, the, the relationship with his nephew more. It had more influence on him than the mission. Okay, and he put people in his sentimentality before what? The work. And he goes off to Cyprus. But here's the good thing. Even though I believe he was wrong in doing that, in God's divine providence, it all worked out for good because he takes John Mark, and we don't hear about Barnabas the rest of the book of Acts, which is very telling. Okay? Very telling. But later on, we hear Paul in, on, when he's writing his swan song, Second Timothy, and he's ready to go home to be with the Lord. He says, you know, tell John Mark to come along. He could be useful now. And in the years that passed, John Mark recovered. Why? Because Barnabas kept taking him under his what? Wing. So we're thankful for that, right? So in the divine providence, even though I believe that Barnabas made a mistake in putting people, especially his sentimentality towards his nephew, above God's work, God used it for what? Good. You see? What was the good? He helped a young man grow up in Christ who later on got reconciled to what? Paul, and he became what? Useful. Divine what? Providence. Paul and Silas went forth, and we're going to read the account of their missionary journey, and it's, it's fantastic how they confirm the churches and souls get saved. Barnabas chose plan B. I'll tell you this, when you're a positive believer, it doesn't mean you always make the exact right decision. Sometimes God puts you before you, his plan A, and for some reason you don't accept plan A, you take plan B, and God says, well, I know you love me, and I, I know you care, you just made the wrong decision here, so we'll use plan B for good. But plan B was my perfect, plan A, excuse me, plan A, A was my perfect will. You starting to get the picture? So God's not, you know, here's the thing about God working all things together for good. If we're positive, even if we make a mistake, God will turn it into what? Some good. That's awesome. But listen, if we're negative and it's all about self and we're arrogant and we keep making bad decisions and it's all about us and we're not cherishing God's word, what happens? Nothing works out for good, right? All right, I got two minutes. Let's close here. Let's read the rest of this. And we're going to pick up next week. And I'm excited about what's coming. It's got, we've kind of laid the groundwork this morning for some important principles. Verse 39, and the contention... That means the conflict, the strife, the dispute was so sharp between them. These, they were going at it, as only really close friends can do sometimes, you know? You know, uh, when you get real close to somebody, you can say things to them that you probably wouldn't say to other people, and you can even say things you shouldn't say, and you know they'll be okay with it, because they say the same to you. And you kind of go back and forth. You're that close, because you know... He loves me, she loves me, I love him, I love her. We, we love each other. We just don't see eye to eye, and we go at it. And we can do that, but we love each other. And these men loved each other. They suffered together in much hardship for the gospel. They knew each man was good and godly, right? But you keep reading. But the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder. In other words, they got to the point where both of them knew, I know you, Paul. You're thick-headed and stubborn, and you're not going to change your mind. And Paul said, well, I know you, Barnabas. You're thick-headed and stubborn, <laughs> and you're not going to change your mind. So what's the only thing to do here? We've got to go our separate ways. We're not going to be able to, to work together on this project. We're going to have to go our separate ways, okay? 
And uh, it says, they departed from one, asunder from one another, and so Barnabas took Mark and he sailed unto Cyprus. And God used that for good. Right? But look at verse 40. And Paul chose who? Silas. Why did Silas stay at Antioch? In the divine providence of God, God knew this dispute would take place, this separation would take place. He knew Paul needed somebody to accompany him. He put it in Silas's heart. You stay because you're the one that's going with Paul. Because Barnabas is going to go another way. Keep reading. And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God, and he went through Syria and Cilicia confirming the churches. And it would seem here that the church sided with Paul. It says the brethren recommended them to do this. The church kind of said, yeah, Paul, we understand what's going on here and we know that John Mark really let you down and Paul was at the place where he knew listen when you go out on these missionary journeys not only do you have to face satanic opposition from the pagans and from the Jews who hate the gospel not only do you have to suffer the hardships of traveling in the ancient world all the physical demands that were required and the burdens of the churches. There is no time to have the luxury of trying to mold this young man into a faithful servant of God. I need men that are already proven faithful servants of God because when I get out there into the battle, it's not the time to start training the soldier. When does the soldier get trained? In what? Boot camp. Right? Then, when he's placed into combat, he's what? Ready. John Mark has not graduated from boot camp yet. I can't use him. Right what? Now. This is going to be an amazing story of God's providential hand at work, and we're going to see something. There are going to be times in our lives as believers that we're going to have to separate from people that we have sentimental attachments for. And if we don't, we're just choosing plan B. If we're a positive believer that loves God, we're choosing plan B, not plan A. You understand what I'm talking about today? God still used Barnabas, and good came out of it, right? Because he's a positive believer. He's a godly man. But Barnabas should have been with Paul. Plan A was... Let's go on this journey and all the people we won to the Lord, me and you, Barnabas, let's go back and visit them and encourage them and build them up. Yeah, let's go, Paul. Uh, I want to take John Mark. No, we're not taking him. Get so bad, they'd go what? They're separate ways. The church says to Paul, we're with you. We recommend Silas. Take him with you. Go. You got our blessing. The rest of the book of Acts, who's the prominent figure? Paul the Apostle. Who's accompanying him? Silas. Who disappears and isn't heard about anymore? Barnabas. Now, does that mean that God never used Barnabas again? No. He went to Cyprus. There was work that went on. But he chose plan B over plan A. Interesting, isn't it? Divine providence. The whole point will be this. Do not put your sentimental attachment to people above what God is calling you to. Do you hear me, folks? Don't do that in life. But even if you do, God will, if you're a truly motivated, positive believer, just not having enough discernment and wisdom, God will still what? He's got a plan B. Thankfully, right? All right, let's bow our heads and go before the Lord. Father, this morning we're grateful and thankful to have had this time to note and study these things from your word, and I pray that you would challenge our hearts, Lord, through the things that we've noted and studied, these principles that come from your word, that we might apply them to our lives and grow in your grace and knowledge. We dedicate the last moment of the service this morning to anyone here, if you're not saved, the Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, 
and thou shalt be saved. Right now in the privacy of your own heart, you can tell God, I know that I'm a sinner. But I do believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He died for my sins and rose again. And Lord Jesus, I'm trusting you and you alone as my Savior, my Lord. Let's take a moment of silent prayer for anyone who wishes to trust Christ. Now, Father, this morning, if your Holy Spirit has spoken to anyone's heart, if they have believed upon the Lord Jesus during the service, my prayer is that you would give them assurance that you've forgiven them, saved them. Pray that you would reveal your love to them in a special way. And I ask that you lead them back to study your word that they might grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We ask these things in his name. Amen. Folks, let's stand. Uh, the deacons will come forward and we'll pray for the offering. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for bringing us here today, Lord. And I just pray that you watch over us. And I just pray for the offering now that you put in our hearts to give the best we can, Lord. Thank you for a pastor that preaches us the truth from your word. Let us support this ministry that we can further reach the lost and the people that need to hear your, your word and the truth, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Before we uh, close in prayer, I have a special announcement to make. As most of you who have been with me for the length of this ministry know, I have been a confirmed bachelor for over 30 years. And uh, I think during that time, I thought, I'm just waiting for the right person to come along. And really, God was saying, no, Richie, I'm trying to get you in the right condition because you need to shape up. Well, by his mercy, I, I can say today that I am officially engaged to be married. <laughs> As of yesterday, and you all know dear Jackie, right? Sister Jackie. <laughs> we are a unique couple in many ways. Uh, and even our engagement proposal was very unique. I'm going to share a funny story with you quickly. Sometimes divine providence can lead you to the parking lot of a McDonald's. <laughs> you say, what are you talking about? Well, you know, when, you, when you're going to propose, you know, you get the ring and you make sure you get the right one. You know, that's important. So you get and usually the woman will show you pictures of things just to make sure you know what it should look like, you know. So that worked out well, and uh, we secured the ring, and uh, I secured the ring, and we were, we were on our way to Boston yesterday to go on a little cruise around the bay. And, uh, you know, it was supposed to be this nice, you know, romantic thing. Her birthday is Monday. This, we're going to celebrate your birthday. I got the ring in my pocket. And at the right time, you know, the right moment, when everything's just perfect, I'll, I'll propose, you know. And so as we're heading to Boston, we pull into a McDonald's, we get an Egg McMuffin and a yogurt parfait. We didn't have breakfast. And then the next thing I know, the serpentine belt on the truck blows. The steering column fails. I can't steer the truck. The engine is overheating, and we're stranded in the parking lot. <laughs> I'm aggravated, she's disappointed. <laughs> so much for the best laid plans of mice and men. 
It's quarter 11, the cruise takes off at 12, we're about a good hour from Boston, so this ain't happening. So uh, I'm sweating and frustrated and AAA is on the way. Thankfully, Jackie's cooler head prevailed and she called AAA while I was trying to figure out what was wrong. <laughs> we men do that, right? So uh, anyways, as we sat there in the parking lot of McDonald's, I said, well, you know what? This ain't going to happen on a cruise up in Boston. Hey, now is as good a time as any. <laughs> And so I propose in the parking lot of the South Attleboro McDonald's over an Egg McMuffin <laughs> and a yogurt cafe. <laughs> and I said to her, you said you wanted to make sure it was memorable. <laughs> and then we rode home in a tow truck. <laughs> Uh, what a really nice fella who had tattoos from his neck down to his, but he was a great guy. And, uh, and anyways, the rest of the day was actually very enjoyable. We regrouped, we did something else, but I just wanted to say, pray for us, pray for us, all right? <laughs> Brother Paul Brown, would you come and close us in prayer? So he was aggravated, she was disappointed. <laughs> what a way to start. <laughs> I would like to pray, because it's so appropriate for me for this service that we had, of my desire that what does it translate to love God in a way that is more than loving ourselves or even loving each other. So, Lord, I pray for that. I pray for us all and especially for John and Jackie, that their vision of loving you is so much greater than the vision of loving themselves. How does that translate for each one of us? How does that translate for this couple, God? Create a vision. God, create a vision for this couple that is so much greater than they anticipated, I pray, and in turn for each one of us. Lord, help us to say yes to that vision of loving and following you fully, I pray today. In Jesus' name I ask, and I thank you for the beauty of this couple. Amen. Amen. Coffee? Don't forget.